powerful choices and preferences and our idea of what is or is not food are strongly determined by social and cultural influences. Let me show you some of the things I normally eat in Italy and that I like a lot. This is a horse steak, pretty common in Italy. This is a steak and kidney pudding, one of the national dishes in the UK. This is a French boudin noir made with pork's blood. This is deep fried breaded brain, so soft and creamy and delicious. This is fegato alla veneziana, beef liver with onions. This is a French terrine made with chicken livers and hearts. This is me eating a spleen and lung sandwich in Palermo, Sicily. Down there it's a very popular sandwich, made with calf lung and spleen, a squeeze of lemon juice and melted cheese. This is a Vietnamese market selling bugs and larvae, cheap, good quality proteins. I did try them once, but it took me a lot of effort. I do, however, like snails and frog legs, both traditional foods in northern Italy. For food, much like for anything else, the idea of what is considered normal or appropriate is a product of our culture. Slaughtering a dog for food is not any more cruel than slaughtering a cow. Yet the thought of eating dog meat or cat meat, which is normal in many areas of China or Vietnam, may repulse you much like many Indians would be disgusted at the thought of you eating cow meat, which they consider sacred. Trying exotic dishes like mealworms, snake, or the yummy fish eyeball sushi that you see in the picture is an individual choice, but respect for the habits and traditions of other cultures in the kitchen, much like in every other area, is indispensable. What we're going to do now is take a quick survey of the major food groups that constitute our typical Western diet. Please know that this is not a complete classification of food items. We're just going to quickly go through the main food categories to which we will refer many times during this course, so that we know what we're talking about. We will also say a few words for each of them just to familiarize a little, but by no means this is intended to be a complete nutritional evaluation of these foods. That would require a separate course on its own. Let's start with plant foods. Fruits and vegetables are a very heterogeneous group of edible plants products. It is a category that makes more sense from a nutritional and commercial point of view, but it is quite arbitrary from a botanical perspective. When we say fruit, for example, we actually only refer to sweet fruits. Eggplant, cucumber, bell peppers and tomatoes are all fruits, botanically, but because they are less sweet, we call them vegetables. The name vegetable can also refer to other parts of the plant, for example, leaves like spinach, roots like carrot, flowers like broccoli, bulbs like onion, underground stems or tubers like potatoes, and many more. Plants can also be eaten at different stages of their growth cycle. For example, most plants can be eaten as sprouts. Of some plants, we also eat the seeds. Seeds belonging to the family leguminose are called legumes, and they have very particular nutritional characteristics, so in nutrition we treat them as a separate category. The edible seeds of other plants that are not legumes are just called nuts and seeds, and they also constitute a separate nutritional category. A very particular type of fruits are those belonging to the family Graminae. These fruits are dry and fused with their seeds, and they are called caryopsis. We call them grains or cereals, and nutritionally, they constitute yet another category. Fruits are very rich in water and fiber, contain little or no fat, small amounts of proteins, variable amounts of carbohydrates, mostly simple sugars, and then organic acids, some vitamins, minerals, and other bioactive compounds, such as polyphenols. As the fruit ripens, its organic acid contents decrease and its sugar content increases. The composition of vegetables is very similar to that of fruit, but they have less sugar, so their caloric value is even lower. They also provide a lot of water, fiber, and micronutrients. Keep in mind, however, that although we often associate the word vitamin with fruits and veggies, they do not provide all of the vitamins we need. Vitamin C, Provitamin A, vitamin K, and some B vitamins such as folic acid are abundant in fruits and vegetables, but other vitamins such as vitamin D, vitamin E, or other B vitamins are scarce or absent. 
Some vegetables also have a lot of the pigment chlorophyll, which makes them green. There are some particular fruits and vegetables that have unique nutritional compositions, so they need to be treated separately. For example, some of them are starchy, meaning they contain a lot of complex carbohydrates. For example, potatoes, sweet potatoes, bananas, and cassava. Some others are fatty, because they contain more lipids, for example, avocados, olives, or coconuts. This is the nutrient composition of an apple with skin. As you can see, it's mostly water, with a significant amount of carbs, 12%, and some fiber, which you mostly lose if you peel it. This is lettuce, and now it's really mostly water, with a little carb, protein, and fiber. This is a banana. Again, a lot of water, but also 20% of carbs, which includes the starch, some proteins, and fiber. And this is a potato with its skin. Water, 15% of carbs, mostly starch, 2% of proteins and 2% of fiber. Again, if you remove the skin, you lose the fiber, which is why you should never ever peel a potato. You also have noticed that none of these plant foods had significant amount of lipids. Nuts and seeds are much more energy dense than fruits and vegetables because they have much less water. They have a lot of good quality lipids and good quality proteins. They also provide a lot of fiber, the amino acid arginine, which is cardioprotective, essential fatty acids, polyphenols, and many vitamins and minerals, including vitamin E and several group B vitamins. Walnuts, hazelnuts, almonds, pistachio nuts, macadamia nuts, cashew nuts, pecan nuts, brazil nuts, pine seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, flax seeds, sesame seeds, chia seeds, and poppy seeds are all members of this category. Peanuts grow underground and are technically legumes because they belong to the family leguminosa. But nutritionally, they are closer to nuts and seeds, so we put them in this category as well. Let's have a look at the composition of walnuts as an example. You can see that 65% of its weight is made of lipids, whereas only 6% is water. There is an excellent 15% of proteins, 7% of fiber, and 7% carbohydrates. These are sunflower seeds. There is a little bit less lipids, but still more than half. A lot more proteins, 21%, and then again fiber, water, and carbs are around 10%. These are peanuts. About half of their weight is lipids. They have much more proteins, 26%, and water, fiber, and carbs are slightly below 10%. We use the word cereals or grains to identify the kernels of plants belonging to the family Graminae. These are actually a particular type of fruit, which is fused with the seed and we call it caryopsis. The most common are wheat, corn, rice, oats, barley, millet, and rye. Although the word cereals reminds many people of the box of breakfast cereals, keep in mind that a slice of bread, a bowl of rice, or a serving of pasta are all cereals as well. Anyway, in this course, to avoid confusion, we will mostly use the word grains, to refer to this category. Each kernel of grain is composed of four different parts. The husk, the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. The husk is the outer shell of the kernel. It is mostly made of fiber and it's generally inedible, so it must be removed. The bran is the second inner shell. It's made primarily of insoluble fiber, but it also has B vitamins, phytochemicals, and minerals such as iron, chromium, and zinc. The germ is the internal seed made primarily of unsaturated lipids. It is very rich in vitamin E to protect them from oxidation, and it also has B vitamins and phytochemicals. The endosperm is the largest part of the kernel, and it is made primarily of starch, although it also contains some proteins, a little bit of fiber, and some vitamins. When we talk about whole grains, we refer to kernels to which only the outer inedible husk has been removed. When the kernel undergoes a milling process to also remove the fiber-rich bran and the lipid-rich germ, leaving only the starchy endosperm, we obtain a refined grain. Later in this course, we will discuss the huge nutritional difference between whole grains and refined grains. In the grain category, we also put the so-called pseudo-grains, which are not grains botanically, because they don't belong to the family graminae, but they have a very similar nutritional value. Some common pseudo-cereals are buckwheat, quinoa, and amaranth. Again, let's make a couple examples. Here we have whole brown rice. 73% of its weight is starch, 
12% water, 8% proteins, 3% lipids, and 4% fiber. This is pasta made with refined wheat. Almost 80% of it is carbs, 6% water, 11% proteins, 1% lipids, and 3% fiber. This is bread made with whole wheat flour. 43% of it is water. Bread is much more moist than pasta. The rest is 34% carbs, 13% protein, 7% fiber because this is whole, and 3% lipids, again because it's whole and has the lipid fraction of the germ. When we say legumes, we usually refer to the seeds of plants of the family leguminosae, such as beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, broad beans, or soybeans. However, sometimes the whole fruit of these plants is eaten. For example, green beans, or the sprouts, such as alfalfa sprouts. Legumes are excellent sources of proteins and starch. They are a great source of group B vitamins, and they provide a lot of minerals such as iron, calcium, potassium, and many others. Also, legumes are an excellent source of dietary fiber, both soluble and insoluble. On the whole, they are a very precious food group, and it's a shame that a lot of people hardly ever eat them. This is the composition of dry lentils. 30% of their weight is carbs, 26% proteins, 30% fiber, 1% lipids, and the rest is water. These are soybeans. You notice they have an exceptional amount of proteins, 36% then 20% lipids, which is also way more than other legumes. But they have less carbs, 21%, 9% fiber, and the rest is water. Mushrooms are technically not vegetables because they are not plants at all. They are a special type of fungus. Once more, in nutrition, we ignore the biological taxonomy and we can consider edible mushrooms to be vegetables because they share most nutritional characteristics. A similar case goes for edible seaweeds. They are large, edible, marine algae, so they are not plants at all, but practically we can consider them to be vegetables, although they do have some unique nutritional characteristics, and particularly, they are the best dietary sources of the mineral iodine. Let's now move on to animal foods. Their main strength is that they provide a lot of high-quality protein, and they are the only sources of vitamin B12. They also provide more zinc, copper, and vitamin D than plant foods. With the word meat, we normally refer to the muscle of animals, be it beef, pork, chicken, turkey, lamb, rabbit, and many other. Other organs, such as the liver or kidneys, are also commonly eaten, but because they have very distinct and generally superior nutritional value than muscle meat, we put them in a separate group and refer to them as organ meats. Other meat products, such as processed meats or cold cuts, also have separate nutritional characteristics and should be considered separately. Let's look at the veal steak. 76% of it is water. There's no fiber and negligible amounts of carbs. About 21% is high-quality protein and 3% lipids. This is after visible fat has been trimmed off, otherwise its lipid content would be a lot higher. There is also some iron, copper, zinc, potassium, and group B vitamins. This is pork ham. The thing you notice is that it has a much higher fat content. Excessive meat consumption is detrimental for many different reasons. Because it provides a lot of protein, but it's poor in fiber, it promotes the selection of unfavorable gut bacteria and increases the risk for colon cancer. The fact that it provides many saturated fats is a concern for cardiovascular disease. Preserved meat or cold cuts have some extra concern, such as a lot of added salt and the use of not-so-desirable additives such as nitrates or nitrates, or polyphosphates. The good thing about organ meats is that they provide a lot more vitamins and minerals because these organs tend to store them more than the muscle does. For example, compared to a T-bone steak, an equal amount of calf liver provides a ton of vitamin A way more group B vitamins, including more than 20 times more vitamin B12, double the iron, more zinc and manganese, a hundred times more copper, and more than twice as much selenium. Let's now look at fish. Technically, it's still meat, just of different animals. But once again, our classification is mostly based on nutritional characteristics, not on biological taxonomy. Compared to meat, fish is easier to chew and digest because its muscle fibers are softer. Another distinctive characteristic of fish is its lipid composition. The fat of fish is of a much better quality. 
than the fat of meat because it's less saturated and has a lot of good omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. Although, as we will see, grain-fed farm-raised fish is not necessarily as good. Fish also has more iodine and selenium than meat. Small fish eaten whole also provide a lot of calcium from their bones and vitamins, vitamin D and A, from their liver. Unfortunately, fish is highly susceptible to environmental pollution and can easily accumulate heavy metals and other contaminants. Also, fish easily deteriorates with storage and high temperature cooking, as its unsaturated fat easily gets oxidized. Let's make a couple examples for fish as well. This is salmon. It's 74% water, 20% protein, 6% lipids, no carbs, no water. Salmon is a fatty fish. Let's now look at sea bass. You see it has less lipids, 2%, 18% protein, and the rest is water. And again, of course, no fiber, no carbs. On we move to eggs. Almost all birds make eggs, and many of them are edible. But if we say eggs without specifying the species they come from, we refer to chicken eggs. I believe eggs are the best among all animal food. They are excellent sources of high quality protein and their fat is of way better quality than meat or milk. Eggs are often viewed with suspect because they have some cholesterol in the yolk. But as we will learn soon, cholesterol content in food has very little to do with blood cholesterol levels. And there are other way more important dietary strategies to control blood cholesterol. So there is no reason whatsoever to limit consumption of eggs for this reason and even individuals with high blood cholesterol, if they have a generally balanced diet, can happily eat two eggs a day, every day. An egg is 76% water, 13% protein, 10% lipid, very little carbs and of course no fiber. Eggs are also good sources of group B vitamins, vitamin A, iron and zinc. And then we have milk and dairy products. If we say milk without specifying the animal it comes from, we are referring to cow milk. Whole milk contains 89% water, 3% protein, 3% lipids, 4% carbohydrates, mostly as lactose, and no fiber. Fat in milk, as you know, is not of the best quality, so if we drink it regularly, we should definitely go for the low-fat version of it. As we will see later in this course, however, drinking many glasses of milk every day is not as healthy as many people believe. It's not good for your bone health and it may increase your levels of inflammation. Two major dairy products made from milk are cheese and yogurt. Cheese can greatly vary in composition, but in general, it concentrates proteins and lipids from milk while losing water and lactose. Because cheese is very energy dense and it concentrates a lot of saturated fats, excessive consumption should be avoided. The Swiss cheese, for example, has only 41% of water and 28% of lipids, 27% of proteins, and 4% of carbs. Yogurt is another important dairy product from milk fermentation. Plain white yogurt is an excellent food because it contains live, health-protective bacteria that improve the bacteria population of our gut with positive outcomes for our general health. Unfortunately, as we will see, Many commercial yogurts contain obscene amounts of added sugar and become a totally unhealthy food.